Well, hello, everybody. I'm Mike. I'm working for IBM Research. And uh, a while ago, I've started working on uh, MM documentation as a, a fun project. Yeah. So it all started a while ago when a colleague of mine uh, asked me some question. Uh, probably that, uh, probably something different. And I wanted to say, OK, go read the manual. And uh, well, there was no actually real manual. And uh, the best we have is a 15, all years, 15 years old book uh, documenting 2.4 Linux memory management. Uh, so uh, the answer is obviously, OK, go read the source. And reading uh, the source of memory management is not uh, something that, uh, well, really easy to do. So I decided that probably getting MM documentation into somewhat better shape would be a nice thing. Uh, obviously, nobody doubts the value of documentation because uh, if somebody, if documentation exists, somebody who reads it can understand what's going on without actually diving deep into 8,000 8, lines files. Uh, and uh, uh, sometimes when people look at the kernel code, they find examples that are not the best practices to use. And obviously, it looks like more professional project. It's very, uh, very popular word, word these days, uh, look professional. For people who've been there around, it also has certain value because when you document your code, you can uh, you can uh, think about it once again after you wrote it and think if it does match what you intended to do or you did something different. Uh, it helps you when you go back after a month, week, and say, oh, who the hell wrote it? So when you have some documentation at least, uh, at least you can say, ah, I thought about this. And of course, when there is documentation, other people can read it. It's obviously helpful. Now, for a person who is uh, new to some parts of the code, completely new to a project or new to some parts of the code, writing documentation definitely helps understand how the things work. Uh, it's been a lot of talks about that uh, joining Linux development communities to find your itch to scratch. So writing documentation can help you there as well because there are less and less itches each year. And of course, documentation will be there. It will help others. So uh, I, when I started, I looked back and uh, I looked at what there is and uh, what can be improved and where we can go further. So what we had a couple of months ago, uh, not that much changed since then, yes, uh, don't take me wrong, but what we had a couple of months ago, uh, we had relatively good coverage for uh, memory-related parts in uh, PROC and CCTL, etc. cetera. Uh, we do have some uh, API description and we have some collection of random documents and thoughts. And uh, like Matthew said a while ago, MEM developers talking to each other. <laughs> uh, a bit in more details. Uh, there is description of uh, user visible interfaces related to memory management. Uh, parts uh, of them are described at uh, documentation CCTL VM. Parts are <coughs> part of PROC PID descriptions. But if you think about an unprepared reader that is not com really familiar with ecosystem and jargon, etc., it's really hard to read them. Really hard to read them. Uh, the part of uh, documentation ABI for MM is nearly absent, although parts are overlapping with some existing documentation in other parts, and. Uh, Additional descriptions of user face visible, uh, user space visible interfaces uh, buried deep inside documentation VM. Uh, the internal API uh, pretty much sums up to a section in the kernel API REST that uh, 
didn't change, it almost didn't change in 2.4 test 2 pre 1 uh, when it was added initially. It has uh, like five, or ten, five to 10 updates since then till now. And uh, most of them were fixes for renaming of files inside kernel. And uh, there is a paragraph in kernel hacking, a guidebook, which nearly hadn't changed, which hadn't changed since 2005, except the conversion Mauro did from TXT to, R to RST. And again, there is documentation VM where MM developers talk to each other. Uh, as for the API reference of the subsystems that probably is one of the most fundamental subsystem widely used outside uh, like in, by other subsystems, uh, we do have some API reference for MM. Uh, I did some gross statistics. So 40% of MM files do have kernel doc commands here and there, which covers roughly 10 to 15% of the functions. Uh, and there are a couple of comments there that uh, nearly kernel doc commands, but they lack the second star in the beginning. Uh, part of them were not completely consistent with the code, uh, particularly when people change the uh, de declaration of the function, they tend to forget about the, the description of the, its parameter in the kernel doc. And uh, since the MM part in kernel API RST was not frequently updated. Most of the even existing documentation is just uh, in a black hole. And uh, the, <laughs> the last, the last but not least, uh, documentation MM. Uh, well, uh, it contains a couple of ten, dozen or so documents uh, which could be real, uh, real guides about certain feature like uh, KSM or transparent huge pages, which could be Linux response on, an email, on a mailing list about uh, active MM and what does it mean. It could be some notes that uh, somebody encountered a problem, uh, uh, an interesting pattern of locking usage and decided to describe it there. So uh, all the kinds of the things uh, and the uh, one of the uh, other interesting parts, like uh, KSM was a complete mix of user visible features and its internal design. Um, more interesting, there are documents that are dated back to 23 to two, and I have really no idea if they're relevant yet, <laughs> still. Uh, probably they don't, probably they do. It's really hard to tell. So since then, I've did a couple of things. I wish I, I could do more, but uh, first of all, I understood that covering it all in one pass is impossible. It's too much code. You need really understand to document it, to describe how MM works. So I've started relative, I've started small with doing some mechanical changes, uh, white space, of course, uh, spelling grammar, which. Uh, sometimes uh, occur not to be correct. Uh, some formatting to kernel documents. Uh, I've added a couple and uh, make uh, the kernel document actually reflect what the function is doing and uh, it's still getting, get, gets, breaked, uh, break gets broken uh, from time to time. The last one was like a week ago. So next, more mechanical things. Uh, I did the REST conversion for documentation VM. And I've started to split user space description from internal uh, documentation uh, for documents that had it. And uh, there is now documentation admin guide MM part, uh, which includes a couple of documents that describe like Things like uh, describe things like KSM, uh, transparent huge pages, and their CFS interfaces and uh, knobs that user can tweak to change uh, how these subsystems behave. 
And uh, the last thing, pretty much last thing I done is that in that area is to link, uh, is, is to make uh, GFP description a kernel doc and link into the entire documentation so it will be visible in your browser because uh, I know that uh, there are many people who object uh, restifying and object uh, seeing HTML instead of simple text files that fit in 80 by 25 terminal. But younger people tend to use browsers. I don't know. <laughs> no names. <laughs> younger people tend to use web browsers and having these things visible and searchable is something that I believe is really useful. And I've added a couple of documents for now relatively small amount, but uh, I'm going to work on it a little bit more, so probably you'll see more sometime eventually. Uh, so as I mentioned previously, reading the CCTL parts of, uh, v of uh, v VM knobs at, at the PROC is somewhat uh, not completely understandable by a newbie or even system administrators that uh, only a couple of years working with it uh, and encountered it the first time that he needs to adjust, uh, I don't know, swappability or uh, some limits of uh, memory, oh, say, I don't know, ohm score or ohm uh, the other one, I don't remember. Uh, <coughs> So I've added uh, some basic concepts overview of Linux MM and the jargon it uses uh, for people to be able to start with something relatively simple. Uh, uh, there was a discussion uh, at, I believe, NetFilter mailing list about which exact GFP flags should be used for which allocations and Vlastimil sent me an email, probably we should add it to the docs. So we've added it to the docs. Uh, we now have a uh, relatively nice, uh, well, let's say, we have relatively concise description of which allocator preferable to use in which case and which GFP flags uh, should be used in uh, most of the cases uh, and which GFP flags probably you don't want to use these days like GFP DMA or something like that. And uh, then I've decided that the whole documentation should be built from the beginning and I've started from uh, boot time memory management. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the way, it was pretty good covered uh, with the kernel documents, both boot mem, no boot mem, and mem block. Uh, and uh, I wrote a description of uh, boot time memory management. I've put it inside the source so, so it will get chance to get updated. And then I've got uh, carried away and I've removed bootmem and no bootmem. <laughs> well, uh, it's difficult to document some uh, fundamental subsystem. First of all, you get carried away. Uh, writing code is usually more fun, but uh, documenting is still fun. But writing code is more fun. Uh, it's very lot of information that you have to handle and you need to dig deep to produce a good doc documentation. Uh, and there is always a problem. You wrote something and you don't like it and you want to improve it and it takes enormous amount of time to, and you should know where to cut and say, okay, I'm saving this, let John figure out how to fix it. <laughs> Okay, what we have now, you can browse actually the documentation at, uh, let me see if it works. Probably does, but just a second, sorry. Okay, uh, the admin guide has got 
these relatively nice descriptions of different memory management features that already were documented, but nobody knew they, their documentation exists. So if you're curious, what do you need to change to make KSM work more or less agile or to control its, uh, its parameters of uh, sharing of the pages? Uh, or if you're interested in, in uh, the sequences you need to do to hot plug and plug your memory, it's all there. <coughs> uh, the, the credit obviously goes to people who actually wrote it, but now uh, it can be visible from, uh, from the outside world and you don't need to download kernel 3 to see the documentation about these features. Uh, another thing, There are a couple of documents that uh, oh, I think I've lost it. Here. This is more or less the whole existing reference documentation for, for MM. Uh, I think it should be reorganized again because it's quite a lot of scrolling. Uh, and it's also completely hodgepodge. Yeah? Like <laughs> somebody wrote a description of this and that. Somebody decided to link, link it to the whole API thing and uh, that's, that's what we got. And uh, it's still unsorted and uh, not really fixed. And uh, there are probably lots of documents that need to be reshaped, removed, updated, uh, but uh, somebody who's interested can try to read them and uh, probably come up with the patches. Like this one, NUMA, I think, what is NUMA? You see, uh, there's some somewhere in now, no, it was the wrong one, sorry. Uh, this one. Uh, it's talk in 2.2 memory balancing page <laughs> information. Uh, so it's not really up to date, right? <laughs> Oops. Okay. Uh, so what? what still needs to be done and I'm going to do some of it and I hope people will stand up and help me at least with something. Uh, so of course we should drop relevant content from uh, the existing name and documentation. Uh, the, par the parts that more naturally belong either to API descriptions or to user visible interfaces should be removed appropriately. And uh, we should think also about how we structure, for example, reference documentation because it enormous size of the HTML and having it in a single file, uh, it's not really good idea. And uh, even more difficult part, uh, somebody needs to write new documentation, okay? And uh, what we actually lack is overview description of how VM scan works, for example, or what is happening when you get a, get a page fault, how it is handled, how Linux allocates memory, what is page allocator in its internals. There is a lot, lot of things that can be described and I believe should be described and uh, I'll uh, keep working on it, but uh, I don't know. I, I surely don't have enough bandwidth to cover it all because it's <laughs> huge. Uh, there is also a reference part that preferably should be added to uh, kernel API descriptions. Uh, apparently, we should start with functions that are used more like kmalloc, which is actually documented, but uh, there are also other parts of uh, MM subsystem that are frequently used, 
but they don't have any documentation and people sometimes use it wrongly. Uh, and uh, the vision is to get uh, what was the understanding the Linux virtual memory management 15 years ago, but updated and in HTML format inside the trees that we can, that visible everywhere and uh, updated is the most difficult part, right? Uh, and something that uh, is relevant to documentation in general, not uh, only to memory management. Uh, for now, we don't look at the documentation part of the patches. So probably it would be a good idea to, ch to teach uh, check patch PL to look at the documentation part, at least to have uh, function parameters consistent in documentation and the, in the function declaration. Uh, ask people to run kernel doc or make w equals one. Uh, also is helpful because you see, oh, warnings, errors. Uh, another thing that could be done uh, is adding make HTML docs as one of uh, OKP targets. So you can get an email, I love your patch, oh, sorry, thank you for the patch, perhaps something to improve. And the warnings that came out from the make HTML docs. And uh, for people who are reviewing patches, please look at the docs part at least sometimes. I know it's difficult, but somebody has to do it. <laughs> well, first thing I want to say is thanks very much for doing all of this work. It's exactly the sort of thing I've been hoping people would do, and it's much appreciated. Thanks. Um, well done. And so along those lines, I wanted to ask, what do you think we could do to further encourage more people to work on the docs? What would make it more easy or more interesting or more fun or more rewarding? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well, uh, as maintainers of, if maintainers would care more about documentation and when somebody sends relatively large feature or something like that, if people would ask for documentation, it will make it more mandatory at least. More fun, it's personal uh, and uh, I don't see a way you can encourage people to document. Unless, uh, there is an option. If you document something, you can write an LWN article and then you get uh, several bucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was just thinking maybe if we had a list of, wish list of things we want to document on a web I don't hear page, some might John. Help. Can you speak up? Uh, I was thinking if, if there were a wish list of things we wanted documented, you know, maybe. Like everything? Uh, <laughs> no, no, just something that would, um, people that are just looking at things might look at it and someone might get inspired to document something. So for instance, uh, user visible interface, I mean user visible from uh, MM to other kernel. Uh, okay, like alloc page is not documented, okay? So probably we want it documented, right? And uh, VM scan does lots of things. It's not described anywhere. So, yeah. I have an idea. Um, you know how you have in security, you have bug bounties for uh, that companies offer in order to find bugs. So we could all get together and put in some money, and there could be a documentation bounty, and so whoever goes and documents a subsystem can win the bounty. <laughs> if, on, if only we had some kind of foundation that could offer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, something that worked for me is always uh, the commit message and the documents within the code. Uh, that helped a lot after along with the blogs that you talk about. It's also good for me. And um, I 
and I, I use the document folder only when there is really deep uh, understanding that needs to be done. But mostly code, documenting in the code and commenting in the code helps a lot in case of referring things then and there. That helps a lot. Other thoughts on what we should be doing? So one thing is obviously you know, getting people to, to collaborate documentation, but you also have to consider uh, maintaining that, that documentation. Um, one of the problems about writing documents for kernel code is that nobody likes it because it changes too fast. So while you need people documenting stuff, you also need people making sure that things are still up to date, uh, you need proofreading, et cetera. Well, it's up to reviewers. Well, yeah, but like um, uh, people, it's up people, to contributors and reviewers. Uh, if re reviewers pay mo more attention to the docs part, it gets updated. If you keep the documentation inside the source files and you add the, the doc section at the beginning, chances it will get updated. I, I wrote uh, for locking various documentation a couple years ago, and I got tired of updating it because it changed, changed too much, um, and now it's like stale, and it, it could probably be even removed. Um, that's why I'm concerned about like what would happen with this. That's, that's two cents. Well, these days the mem doesn't seem to change that fast. Uh, I can't say about other subsystems, but core mem uh, is more or less stable. It doesn't get revolutionary. Uh, changes, uh, revolutionary changes. So <clears throat> I believe we can have updated documentation for memory management, at least for the core parts. Uh, I can say about uh, other subsystems. Other thoughts? Volunteers? Oh, no, no, no. Uh, I, I, I have a thought, Paul. I mean, we've got, uh, what, 100 or so people in the room. If everyone commits to writing just one function document, that's an extra 100 functions we've got documented. <laughs> Come on, people, send patches. John takes patches. He's really polite about it, too. There you are. John D. Day, remember. <laughs> uh, you did the document about the uh, get user page. Uh, to be fair, uh, w while I accept the logic of if everyone documented one function, things would be grand. One of the biggest difficulties in understanding MM overall is its emergent behavior. This would be particularly problematic with VM scan because it's not what the function is doing, it's how it beha behaves in combinations of several different events. It's not either here nor there, but it's not just about documenting function. The emergent behavior is somewhat, uh, somewhat critical. Um, another thing, one. Th a couple of things have been enforced in terms of documentation and the MM subsystem, and it's mostly been driven by the maintainer. User visible effect of patches is nearly always has to be described in the change log. Very rare that there's exceptions to it. And it's the same for any of the PROC and SIS uh, control <coughs> ones. They always end up with documentation because the maintainer mandates it. Now, because of the difficulty of documenting MM in general, the history has been that the change logs tend to be extremely descriptive. And it's one of the reasons why MM patches that do cleanups, like white space or grammar corrections or any of the rest of it, tend to get rejected because they make the use of git blame harder. Because at least for me, and I know for a couple of other people who are involved in the MM in the past, they've depended very heavily on git blame. So it is kind of the case we've reached a point where the core is relatively stable. And at least the last six months of MM activity have all been at the edges. You might be able to get some traction about if, they, if you ask the maintainer to push people to put some of the information that's in change logs into a documentation file as well and not just rely on git blame. But I know every time that I have to revisit some part of the MMM and understand what's going on, it's git blame I'm relying on 100% of the time. I didn't even know that document in the user administration guide existed. It never occurred to me to even look for it. So you're saying we should make it, we get blame automatically generate the documentation? God, no. 
<laughs> that, that would fail the emergent behavior test because the Git commit from like five years ago, maybe the last time that code changed, it doesn't mean that it's still relevant. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's an archi it's a historical tool that is extremely useful for understanding why we got to a particular place. But well, going forward, <laughs> it could be something that could be enforced better. Well, probably there is another talk now at the Kernel Track Summit about uh, AI building uh, stable kernels. We can build <laughs> AI to build documentation from the history. I, I think people have enough personal strong views on the use of machine learning for cherry picking stable patches that we probably don't want to get into that rattle. Well, at least they would be more motivated to generate documentation if that was the alternative, right? <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? If not, let's thank the speaker and especially this question on documenting VMs. <laughs>